Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I always forget, uh, I get into it. Um, <laughs> really important that I hit record. So um, anyways, so the biochemistry of our living cells, metabolism, the heart of metabolism is uh, breaking down fats and sugars so that we can get energy from them. And the way we break them down is through catabolic chemical reactions. It's chemistry. It's the molecules of sugar and fat. Molecules are a chemical principle, and we're going to be talking about uh, various molecules uh, today. And well, you might not get there today. Today's atoms, really. Um, but next time, for sure. One more off the top of my head, very important. We're going to be talking about biological molecules after this uh, series on chemistry. Biological molecules include DNA, include proteins and enzymes, they include carbohydrates, they include fats, lipids. These are very, very important things in biology that are part of our cells, that are part of uh, the way that we can generate energy. So I can move my hands like this. Um, and the way that these molecules are constructed are through these molecular bonds. And the strength and the weakness of these bonds determines the activity of these molecules, which I'm going to refer back to uh, throughout. Um, one more I just thought of is water. Uh, water uh, is really probably the most important molecule for life. In fact, on Mars, they found water underground, and that's what they were looking for as a potential means of life. Water, as we'll discuss in the third lecture of, on our chem, in our chemistry series, is fundamental to living things. We are made of 99% water, uh, and all of these important reactions can only take place in water, as we'll discuss. Um, and we'll discuss why that is too, and it has to do with chemical principle. So chemistry is important. And so we begin. We begin. Any questions before I begin? Um, I know the lab is due tomorrow, so I can answer lab questions after the lecture if you want, um, if you have any. So just let me know. OK. Here we go, chemistry. <laughs> the first thing we're going to start with chemistry is the atom. Uh, and we're going to be drawing what we call Bohr models. So I'm going to go to the whiteboard, actually. Okay. So Niels Bohr was a chemist. His big discovery was um, discovering the configuration and how atoms are arranged. Uh, let me admit this person. I'm just gonna check my email once more before we get into things, just in case the link, I think everyone saw it. Let's try. Okay, we're good. So we're gonna be doing uh, what we call Bohr models, which are the way, the way that we draw atoms. What is an atom? A-T-O-M. An atom is the smallest fundamental unit of matter. What is matter? Matter is really the scientific word for stuff. The stuff in our universe, in this universe. Uh, I don't know if there's more than one, but <laughs> anyways. Um, Solids, liquids, gases, these are all considered matter, and they're all made of atoms. Atoms are extremely, extremely small. Uh, in fact, a period at the end of a sentence is composed of millions of atoms. So there's a lot, uh, very small. And so when we look at an atom and the Bohr model of an atom, just go back to the slide here looks like this. And this, so this is the atomic, atomic structure for carbon, carbon, an atom of carbon. So in an atom of carbon, 
we have a nucleus that contains protons and neutrons, and then we have these outer rings or shells that contain electrons. So I'm going to write all of this down. So let's, I forgot my notes here. OK. So that's the, a Bohr model for carbon. So I'm going to write down that the nucleus, the nucleus of an atom is this dense core at the center of the atom called a nucleus. And it contains protons and neutrons. Contains protons and neutrons. Well, what are those? We're going to be talking about them. <laughs> so don't worry. They're actually uh, subatomic particles, but we're going to be looking at that next. Just know that the nucleus is where the protons and neutrons are located. And then, like I said, on the outer uh, rings or shells, so the rings or the shells, we call them electron shells because those are where our electrons are located, another type of subatomic uh, particle contains electrons. Okay. So that's a representative Bohr model on the slide, but we're going to be drawing uh, more examples of these Bohr models uh, with a nucleus and then these electrons that orbit around, around the nucleus. Okay. So I want to talk about these subatomic particles now. Um, so we're actually uh, going to be doing a table of sorts. I'm going to do it on the board. So I'm going to kind of rewrite some of this, namely the, the ones that are blank. So location, charge, and importance of proton, neutron, and electron. So location, charge, and importance. So let's, let's redraw that and make a uh, table. Find my eraser here. But before we fill it out, I just want to say it's a subatomic particle, meaning subatomic. Subatomic. It is within the atom. Subatomic. Within, uh, yeah, within the atom. So our subatomic particles. We're going to talk about three of importance. These are particles. They are really, really small, considering they're within an atom, right? Subatomic. So we've got, kind of color coded here, protons, which I abbreviate as a P with a plus superscript. Uh, neutrons. I'm doing Green. Abbreviate as an N with a zero superscript uh, just up there. And then electrons, I'll do in blue with a minus. So it's an E with a minus. OK. So we're going to fill out this table and this table is sort of won't make that much sense right now. It's sort of something that I want you to just keep in the back of your head as we talk more about the importance of these particles uh, and how they relate to chemistry. Okay, so uh, so what are we doing? Location, charge, and importance, right? So I'll actually rewrite that. 
So location, charge, and importance is a little longer, so there should be enough room, but. Okay, let's see if you're paying attention. Where are protons located? Perfect, nucleus, totally. Oh, color coding. Let's do it all in red for the protons. Yeah, so the protons are in the nucleus of an atom. What do you think the charge is of a proton based on how I abbreviate it? Yeah, it's positive charge. It's a plus charge. So, uh, so one proton is one plus charge. One unit of uh, a positive charge, exactly. Uh, and the importance, like I said, this won't make too much sense yet. So it's more of a something to go back to when you're studying uh, and a preface for its import, uh, for why these are significant um, in chemistry. So we're going to write for importance of the protons contributes to atomic mass And then one more important fact about protons, they contribute to the atomic mass and they also determine the identity of the atom. So the identity of the atom is based on the protons or the number of protons. And importantly, the number of protons, we call this the atomic number. I'll be mentioning this, mentioning this again. So I'll just write atomic number for now, because I believe on the next, yeah. Yep, next slide, I'll be talking about that. But remember, this is just to go back to. It'll make a lot more sense. Okay, let's move on to the neutrons. Where are my neutrons? No charge, we'll get there. Nucleus, yep. They're in the nucleus with our protons. And they have no charge, they're neutral. Neutrons are neutral charge. They have a zero, nothing, no positive, no negative. And so they have a couple important roles as well to play. And the first, they also, like protons, contribute to the atomic mass. Might run out of room for the electrons, but we'll figure it out. So they contribute to the atomic mass. And then again, this won't make sense yet, but it will. So they are important when we determine the isotope of a group of atoms. isotope. So, of course, we haven't talked about what that means, but we will. Just keeping in mind that neutrons are important when we talk about isotopes.
Okay. So I'm going to write, well, I think I'll do, what am I going to do? Yeah, I'll probably erase this and because usually I have a bigger board, but let's start with the electrons here. Where are our electrons in the atom? Yeah, they're in the rings or the shells. They're in the electron shells or rings, whatever you want to call it. Charge minus, right? Minus charge, one electron is one minus or negative charge, yep. Um, so on your paper, just write below for electrons, their importance. I'm just gonna have to erase this because I ran out of room. And the main thing with the electrons uh, is that they determine the reactivity of um, the atoms or the atom that we're talking about. And really, their reactivity or uh, their ability to form chemical bonds. And as we'll see, electrons are really the key player in chemistry, uh, especially with biology. And that this reactive uh, property of atoms and their electrons and forming bonds, uh, it really determines what molecules look like, what uh, compound substances look and act like. We're gonna we're gonna see that. But these are all the subatomic particles that we'll find in an atom. Okay. So Move on to, oh, before I move on, uh, I do want to address the mass column here. Very interesting. So protons have a mass of about one. And an AMU, write it on the board, an AMU, AMU stands for atomic, mass unit. And so protons, one proton is about one AMU, has about one atomic mass unit for each proton. And then for neutrons, it's about the same. It's about one, one AMU. But the key thing I just want to emphasize here is that electrons, 0 0.0005 AMUs. So that's extremely small. That's like a five tenths, or what is that? <laughs> a, a ten thousandth or something of a proton and neutron. So the mass, the mass of an electron is significantly smaller than protons and neutrons, but Interestingly enough, they have uh, a charge of minus one. Um, it's not like 
a 10,000th of a charge or anything. But just keeping in mind that electrons are so small, and that's actually why I didn't write for importance of electrons, that they contribute to the mass of the atom. They're, they're negligible. They're so small that they don't, no matter how many electrons you have, they, they won't cause the atom to have any more mass that we care about. It's just too small. So the protons and neutrons are the only ones that will contribute to the mass. And I will talk about what, what is mass on the next slide. What do I mean by mass? OK. Well, we did a metric lab, right? So you, you're a little familiar, right, with what mass means. Um, first, before we uh, take a look at our periodic table of elements, I want to talk about, so if you'll see here, actually, on the periodic table, I'll talk about what an element is and everything. You'll see all these chemical symbols. And they have numbers and stuff uh, and names. So I just kind of want to address what those mean uh, and what an element is. Uh, but yeah, so OK, let's do that. Before I continue, are there any questions so far? Things are abstract right now. But things will become clear, I promise, about the important facts and such. OK, so let's, oh. Yes, so AMU is an atomic mass unit. So we're going to see that atomic mass uh, is talking about AMUs. In fact, this bottom number here represents the atomic mass of an atom of carbon. One atom of carbon has 12 AMUs, atomic mass units. So we're going to see that because protons and neutrons, one proton is one AMU, we'll be able to determine how many protons and neutrons are in an atom of carbon. So I'll keep this up while I erase the board. Okay. So I'm actually going to go ahead and uh, rewrite this this here on the board and point out what what everything means. So we got carbon. This is carbon. Okay. So if we're looking at the periodic table and we have this information given to us, the number up here on top of the chemical symbol, so this is the, the chemical or the, the symbol for the element. So the element symbol, so carbon is represented by a big C here. Um, the number on top, this six, is the atomic number. And what the atomic number is, is the number of protons in an atom of carbon. So this is called the atomic number. So if I ask, what's the atomic number for carbon? It is six, meaning an atom of carbon has six protons in its nucleus. OK, so now we know that an atom of carbon has six protons in its nucleus. This number down here is the atomic mass. And because we just learned that the protons and the neutrons, the neutrons, <laughs> neutrons contribute to the atomic mass, we know that the atomic mass equals the amount of protons plus the number of neutrons. 
But I just found out from the atomic number up here that this carbon atom has six protons and an atom of carbon has an atomic mass of 12. So how many neutrons does an uh, uh, atom of carbon have? Yeah, it has six, exactly, exactly. So six neutrons, six protons, mass of 12. One more thing I wanna talk about, because we really covered everything in this sim uh, um, diagram here. But in a neutral atom of carbon, neutral meaning it has an overall charge of zero, this number is also gonna represent the number of electrons. So I'm gonna write number of electrons in a neutral atom with an overall charge of zero meaning there's also six electrons in a neutral carbon atom. And the reason I'm telling you this is because when we draw Bohr models, we are working with neutral atoms. And when we draw electrons and stuff, we want to, and we want to know the number of electrons, we're working with neutral atoms. So if we know the number of protons, we know the number of electrons in a neutral atom because the overall charge will be zero. Six pluses and six uh, minuses. Okay, so let's look at the periodic table. So this is the periodic table of elements and it is, as you can see, it's organized by atomic number, starting from one all the way up here to 118, and everything in between. So the number of protons it's organized by. Um, and you'll also notice, as, I, as we said in the table that we drew, uh, that one of the important things about protons is it determines the identity of the atom. So if you have 26 protons in the nucleus, you are iron. That is your identity. But if you have 27 protons, you're cobalt. So you can see why the protons uh, determine what element you are. Now, what's an element? Uh, an element is defined as, uh, I think they define it as, the uh, smallest unit of matter that cannot be broken down, but really it's, it's just a type of atom is what it is. So I kind of use the analogy, I really like the analogy that um, an element is like a flavor of ice cream and an atom is a scoop. It's a unit of that element. So if I had, or let's say, if we look, at the screen again here. Um, let's say carbon is chocolate ice cream. See, that works. Um, <laughs> and then we'll say phosphorus is vanilla. That's, that works. And then nitrogen, strawberry. So if I had two atoms of carbon, I would have two scoops of chocolate ice cream. And then if I had three atoms of phosphorus, that's three scoops of, what did I say, vanilla? And let's say I had five scoops of strawberry ice cream, that's five nitrogen atoms. So different flavors, an atom would represent a unit of that ice cream, or a scoop, I guess. Um, what else did I wanna say? Uh, in biology, so I guess another thing that's I like to say when we look at this table here, uh, in biology, we are concerned with maybe six of these. Uh, chemists deal with everything else. Um, and that's mainly because 
unless you're a cyborg, you're not going to have nickel or, you know, aluminum in your bones or whatever. Um, so the chemists deal with that. The elements that we're going to deal with mostly are hydrogen and carbon. Carbon for sure is, uh, in fact, an organic molecule. The, the definition of an organic molecule is a molecule composed of carbon atoms uh, or mostly carbon atoms. Uh, nitrogen here, uh, oxygen, and that's about it. Phosphorus a little bit plays a role, uh, but really HCNO, those are going to be everywhere in biology. A little bit of phosphorus here and there, a little bit of calcium, potassium, sodium, but really those four are the main players. Okay. Isotopes. Yes, question. Why are some of the atomic numbers bracketed? That might be a great question for a chemist. Oh, atomic mass? Yeah, it's probably a chemistry thing. Uh, like I said, we don't go to, we skim the surface of chemistry, but let's take a look. Oh yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. That's a great question. But like I said, these are like, serious in-depth chemistry elements that I would never in my career and as a biologist and professor of biology, we will never talk about seaborgium. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, you should ask in chemistry and get back to me. I'm, oh, here we go. There are no stable isotopes for it. Whoa. See, that's, I had no idea. Huh, crazy, cool. All right, I'm always learning. Uh, but yeah, speaking of isotopes, but that, yeah, it's very interesting. I, man, yeah, it can get crazy with chemistry and physics. Uh, isotopes, we're gonna see that they're radioactive. I just watched the television series uh, on HBO, um, Chernobyl, and just, the crazy, crazy physics phenomena that exist with isotopes and when we deal with quantities of energy of that magnitude with what isotopes are, it's just, oh man, it's crazy. <laughs> like exploding stars type crazy of the sun. And we don't do that. <laughs> we, don't, we don't go there. But uh, okay, so let's talk about isotopes and what that is. So I mentioned them when I talked about our neutrons, right? So let us talk about isotopes. How are we doing on tempo here? Oh, we're doing great. Okay. Oh, okay. Isotopes. So I'm going to erase this. Let's define an isotope is. Okay. So isotopes are atoms. Atoms that have the same number, atoms that have the same number of protons and electrons so same number of protons and electrons, but a different number of neutrons, but a different number of neutrons. We 
call those isotopes. And isotopes are not very stable. They don't like that. Uh, so we're gonna look at a few uh, on the slide. Okay, so let's take a look at some on this slide here. So here are three isotopes of carbon, carbon 12, carbon 13, and carbon 14. Uh, isotopes, carbon, well, carbon 12 has an equal number of protons and neutrons. It's not different. And um, unless I specifically say we're dealing with an isotope, uh, of carbon, uh, it'll have the same number of neutrons as it does protons. As you can see on the periodic table, its, a, its atomic mass is 12. So you know it has six uh, neutrons in addition to its protons. But then if we look at carbon-13, you'll see it has seven uh, neutrons. So what is the 13 referring to? And here in carbon-14, what is the 14? Yeah, it's the mass, exactly. Yeah, because we learned that the mass is the protons plus the neutrons, right? So in a normal non-isotope you know, isotope of carbon, uh, carbon-12, has six neutrons, six protons. But then as soon as you change, right, that's our definition here, a different number of uh, neutrons to that carbon, you get a larger mass uh, when you start to add neutrons. And that creates this carbon-13 isotope. And it's not very stable, carbon-14 either. There's, they don't like that, and it makes it actually radioactive, uh, giving off radioactive energy. Um, why are we learning about isotopes in biology? Why? Why would these things matter? Well, the two primary important reasons. Uh, so I'm going to write uses of isotopes. They actually have uses in technology, really. So uses for these radioactive isotopes. Right, reading my notes here. So the first one, very uh, important for biologists, uh, is carbon dating or just fo you know fossil dating. So we'll write um, carbon dating or fossil dating if you're using a different isotope than carbon like potassium. So these, this is used, I kind of ran out of room, so I'll write it here. Used to determine age of fossils. So if you have a fossil embedded in um, this rock, you'll be able to, de uh, to detect uh, isotopes within the fossil, uh, such as carbon-14. And interestingly, because these isotopes are radioactive, they do this thing called radioactive decay, meaning they decay over time, which is this fancy-ish word for it's becoming a different element over time, but you don't have to know that. Just know that um, 
because these isotopes are radioactive and unstable, they decay and um, we, we can measure the amount of time it takes for half of the amount of the isotope to decay. And for carbon-14, for about half of the carbon-14 to decay, takes about 5,700 years. So if you look at a specimen and you, you see that, let's say, you know, 90% of it decayed, um, probably be 30,000 year old fossil. Um, so that's, that's kind of how that works. Um, and that's why, why it's important for uh, fossil dating. Another important use for isotopes for those going into the nursing medical field uh, is radioactive, or you could say medical tracing or medical tracers. Medical tracers. And uh, these medical tracers, uh, essentially, for certain scans, like a PET scan, uh, you can, a PET scan sometimes can be used for detecting tumors, um, a cancerous lesion, and cancerous lesions love to take up a molecule called glucose. And so if you give a patient uh, glucose to see where the tumor might be or if it metastasized and maybe there's a tumor somewhere else in the body. If you give them glucose, but you label it or you attach a radioactive isotope to the glucose, um, you can actually detect it with a PET scanner. Um, gets a little bit physics-y with how they do it, but um, because it's kind of like an x-ray, because there's radioactivity to it, you can measure it or you can detect it with uh, a type of uh, medical instrument and wherever the glucose goes, you'll be able to see. So that's, that's uh, another use of uh, isotopes relevant to biology. Okay. Next up. Okay, let's see. Making good time. Any any questions so far? Making sense? Okay. All righty. So I mentioned, so we kind of, we talked about the importance really of protons and neutrons, but I mentioned that the real crucial uh, star of the show are the electrons. Yeah. So uh, we're going to, and I, I mentioned we're going to be drawing Bohr models. Uh, of the with these electrons and uh, we're going to go over how to do that and we're also going to go over well yeah the electron shells and sort of how they're arranged and their importance so let me go ahead and erase this and it's kind of fun to draw these models I think <laughs> where's my eraser oh. Okay, so electron shells. So 
So there are multiple electron shells that surround the nucleus. I'll just tell you right off the bat here, we, as in biology, we're, we're gonna go up to the third shell. Beyond that, it gets crazy. <laughs> and we'll leave it to the chemists. Molecular orbital theory, I have nightmares to this day. Uh, so fascinating-ish, I mean, it is, but it, well, it gets really complex. So we're gonna stick with the first three shells. They're the only ones involved in the important atoms of biology. So let's talk about the first shell uh, first. And actually, as I do this, um, I'm gonna be drawing a Bohr model. So <clears throat> a representative Bohr model here. And the first thing I'll draw, let's write, or model. First thing I'll do, I think I need another color. Hold on. I'm going to draw the nucleus first. Maybe I, I'll just use this for now. So let's just start with our nucleus. And our nucleus contains protons and neutrons. Oh, I don't want to go into d orbitals. Yeah, <laughs> we'll leave it to the chemist. Uh, yeah, I'll talk about it someday with one of you. Um, if you want to after class. Um, I'm always curious about learning new things. Um, okay, so here's our nucleus. And we're going to start to go outward as we draw more electron shells surrounding the nucleus. So the first electron shell, um, let's see, I'm just gonna, yeah, I'll rewrite it, it's fine. First electron shell, actually, I'm gonna color code it, color code it. Let's do, what do I have? Blue. So our first shell holds a maximum of two electrons. Maximum two electrons. So what I'm gonna do is draw our first shell with two electrons, like that. And emphasize that in that first shell, I can't put any more electrons there, just two. Okay. Let's do, okay, so back to the slide here. The second and the third electron shells, I uh, group them together because, oh, someone's joining, oops, there we go. Because they hold a max, so let's do, Do the same color? Actually, why don't I do um, thinking on the fly here? Let me see. Yeah, I'll do uh, separate it out. So I'm going to write second electron shell and it holds a max eight electrons. Okay, definitely need to write smaller. <laughs> Holds a maximum of eight electrons. I wrote smaller so I can draw it out. And so let's do that. Um, and I'm wanting to pay attention to how I draw these electrons. Uh, namely, I do it one at a time. 
one at a time in four positions. I go clockwise. You can go counter, whatever you want to do. But I'm going to put eight electrons in this second shell. And watch how I do this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Just like that. Last, our third shell. Also, just like the second shell holds a maximum of eight electrons. And I'm going to just say I have six right now to work with. And so I'll show you how I do this. So if I have six electrons and I go one at a time, one, two, three, four, five, six. And I'll sort of emphasize why the one at a time thing is so important when we practice drawing another uh, Bohr model for an actual atom, not just like a template here. So I want to define a term called valence electrons. Valence electrons. The valence electrons are our outermost electrons. They are the electrons in the furthest out ring from the nucleus. Those are our valence electrons. So if I were to ask you, in this atom I drew, how many valence electrons are there? Yeah, there's six, exactly. Yep. One, two, three, four, five, six. Perfect. OK. So two very important points to show you next on our slide. Oh, we did that. OK. Atoms prefer to have full electron shells. Very important. In this way, when they're full, they are the most stable. And we like that, or atoms do. Uh, if the third electron can have... Right, so Hayat asks a great question. Uh, for this example, because there can be eight maximum, doesn't mean there are eight. And so that it actually refers to that first bullet point. Uh, atoms want the full eight. They want these full shells. That's how they're most stable. And we're going to see that when they're not full in this outer valence shell here, they're going to form what we call chemical bonds with other atoms to fill up their shells. And of course, we're going to look at this in detail and how this happens. Uh, for now, I'm laying the foundation of sorts. But yes, you can have up to eight in the second and third shells. And we want these shells to be full. And if they're not full, they, and when they're incomplete, they'll want to bond. And here we have um, here we have two electrons in the valence shell that are unpaired. They're two unpaired electrons. These ones are paired up. Are we going to talk about 
what it means for an atom to be unstable. Uh, it just means that <laughs> it gets into thermodynamics a bit and sort of um, the laws of the universe. So we don't really, that's more physics. So we don't get too much into that. But the law of the universe is that if there's a more stable, lower energy state in a molecule or an atom, that's what's going to happen. It's going to do whatever it can do to get to that lower energy state. Uh, so don't worry about that. Um, I would just know that atoms prefer to have eight electrons. They're most stable that way. Uh, and stability is good. So it's going to try and bond with other atoms to fill up this shell. And because today's lecture is focused on atoms, we might not make it to bonds today. We might, we might get to the first part of it, but because we're doing really well on time, but uh, let's practice doing this with an actual atom. This was more of a template uh, representative of how we do it and the rules, right? But let's practice with nitrogen. So I'm gonna erase this. All right, so let's try practicing drawing an atom of nitrogen, drawing a Bohr model of nitrogen. Okay. So as we can see from, I pulled this from the periodic table for nitrogen. Um, an atom of nitrogen has an atomic number of seven, right there. So I'm gonna write that on the board. So the atomic number of, for nitrogen is seven. So what does that mean? What does that tell us? What was atomic number? Protons, exactly. Nice. So we know that nitrogen has seven protons. And remember, I mentioned we're dealing with neutral atoms when we do these Bohr models. Neutral atoms. So when I say that, how many electrons does a neutral nitrogen atom have? Perfect, seven, seven electrons. And that makes it so that there's no charge, right? Neutral, zero, no charge. And so that's the important uh, thing when we, when we uh, start drawing these models is we want to determine how many electrons there are. So now that we know that, we have seven electrons. Let's draw a nitrogen. So we can start with our nucleus. And sometimes I'll put the chemical symbol in the nucleus, so N for nitrogen. Or you could shade it in however you want. So we have seven electrons that we're working with. Let's draw our first shell. How many go in the first shell? Two, awesome. One, two, can't put any more than that. Let's move on to the next shell. How many more do I have to work with here? I used two, five left, exactly. 
And now remember, one at a time clockwise. One, two, three, four, five. And that's nitrogen. Let me show you why the one at a time thing is really important to kind of emphasize or, you know, ingrain it in your memory here. Let's say I did that, but I didn't listen to Professor LaRue and I did it, I didn't do it one at a time. So I had five electrons left and instead I did this. One, two, three, four, five. That's not how nitrogen looks. It's not how nitrogen behaves chemically when we look at molecules with atoms of nitrogen in it. Um, so, one at a time, we wanna do that because it'll look different and behave differently when we do it one at a time and that's what we see in the universe. <laughs> what we see is that nitrogen, three, four, five, has three unpaired electrons. Three unpaired electrons. And when we look at chemical bonds and the formation of molecules, we'll see that nitrogen likes to form three bonds with three other atoms because of that. Any questions so far? Okay. <laughs> What's my favorite element? Uh, carbon. Because, yeah, I'm a biologist, so any biologist who doesn't say carbon isn't a biologist because when we look at biological molecules, you're gonna find that all of them have an immense amount of carbon in it. Um, all life is based on the carbon atom. Uh, so, good question. But nitrogen's great too, because nitrogen, really quick, uh, <laughs> uh, nitrogen's an important atom in proteins. Um, and uh, it actually is involved in this very uh, amazing process uh, called transamination uh, and the urea cycle, which is how we get rid of toxic ammonium ion in the liver and excrete it as urine, urea, which has nitrogen in it. It's a powerful uh, uh, atom, as it were. Anyways, I digress, okay. Let us continue. But yeah, in proteins, uh, nitrogen is uh, very frequent and important. Okay. So let's practice with how many electrons will go in each shell for the following atoms. If we look at oxygen first here, uh, based on what we just practiced. How, well, let's first ask how many electrons are in an oxygen atom? And again, we're working with neutral atoms, right? So how many? Yes, eight, because we have eight protons. Our atomic number is eight, so we have eight electrons. How many will go in the first shell? Two. How many do we have left? Six, exactly. And then how many go in the third shell? Yeah, <laughs> none left. We don't have any left to put in the third shell, exactly. Cool. Let's look at silicon, or silicon, whatever. Um, <clears throat> uh, first shell, two. 
Second shell. Yeah, eight. How many do we got left? Yes, we have four. We've used 10 so far, and we have 14 total. So third shell, we get the remaining four. Awesome. OK, you guys got it. What time is it? I wonder if we have time to start. Yeah, we can start bonds uh, and then call it a day. So we're going to start bonds now. And the first bond is James Bond. Just kidding. Ha ha ha. Um, <laughs> no, it's a, an ionic bond. An ionic bond. So there's three kinds of bonds we're going to discuss in this class. The first that we'll cover is called an ionic bond. But first, we need to talk about what an ion is. So let's go back to the board. OK, so we're talking about ionic bonds first. And like we've been talking about, we start with neutral atoms, right? Neutral atoms where where the number of protons equals the number of electrons. But sometimes something interesting can happen where a neutral atom can lose an electron. So if an atom loses a negatively charged particle, does it become more negative or less negative, meaning more positive? Yeah, it's less negative. It becomes more positive, right? You're losing a negative charge. You get rid of that negative. Uh, so you actually are more positively charged now. Uh, so we call a positively charged atom a cation. So I'll just use red for that. A cation. You know, oh man. <laughs> well, I'm looking at the time, and I think uh, I think I'm just gonna end it because it's 4:14. We covered a lot today, uh, so we'll just pick up with ionic bonds on Tuesday. I think that's a, probably a better idea. Um, so, yeah. Anyways, um, okay. Any questions? Uh, any questions about the lecture? And then if anyone has lab questions too, I can um, stick around. But yeah, I think uh, since it's 4.15, we're going to just stop now. <laughs> we'll, we'll start chemical bonds on Tuesday. So any questions at all? Um, and if not, just email me uh, if anything comes up. About the lecture questions. OK, cool. Ooh, OK. Oh, Anastasia, I know you emailed me. Uh, if that was in your, I didn't have a chance to look yet, but I can answer anything right now, too. Um, la, la, la. Let me answer Sophia first. So are they due on the day of the exam? Yes. So the, or if you're referring to the extra credit study questions, then yes, that's um, Correct. So they're optional. They're extra credit. And when we have exam one, uh, depend, you know, all of them are due then. 
depending on how many you complete. You can type them out. Yep. Yeah. Some of them, I think, will ask to do some drawing type stuff, so it might be harder to draw, but you can type out anything you uh, want to write words to the answer. Extra credit questions are on Canvas under modules. Um, they're the study questions. I hope I posted them. I'll check, but check. They are? Okay, sweet. So Anastasia, let's see. For, okay, so the lab. By the way, if anyone um, doesn't have, you don't have to stick around, you know, but if you want to listen in on these questions, just wanna throw that out there. So, but class is over. So, <laughs> uh, all the predators in this lab are a favorite food of hawks, and the forceps, wait, the prey in the lab or the mice, right, are the food of the hawks, yeah. And the forceps predator, wait, 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 for A. Let me look at A, A, because the forceps are a predator and the toothpicks are the prey, right? Uh, so, I don't have it printed out, do I? It's in the post lab. Oh, I can 